I think we'll get started now. We'll just give people a chance to arrive on the venue, but we'll give them plenty of time. So, uh, welcome to this seminar of the Digital Humanities Research Group. It's a regular seminar series that we hold uh, here, and we tend to invite people who uh, may be visiting Sydney, uh, who we, we get to come and speak in this sem seminar, or the local people um, who we identify. So, it's not just people from our own university, but we tend to, to actually have visitors more than our own people. Um, and we're very fortunate to have a number of um, guests in the room from different institutions, I can see. Uh, but our main speaker today, uh, we're very honoured to have Lou Lancaster speaking, a uh, founder in digital humanities work, uh, known for his uh, founding efforts in the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative, in Buddhist studies and many other digitisation projects uh, and programmes around the world. And uh, also speaking with him today will be Sarah Kenderdine, who uh, collaborator and also um, were very well known for her immersive uh, visual displays and research you know, in, in the visualisation of data. So we've got a, a double a double bill, as it were. Uh, and in the audience, uh, I can see a, a guest, um, Stephen Davidson from the uh, UCLA Digital Library Program. Um, these are just some of the people who come to this fantastic seminar series. But of course, it wouldn't be, uh, it's not just about the guests, it's about creating a sense of community around digital humanities. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have, have you all here today. Um, so, without waiting any longer, I'd like to introduce Lou Lancaster. Thanks, Lou. Very much, Paul. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm very happy to be sharing the platform today with Sarah Kenderdine, who is now professor of the University of New South Wales, who have been working together for some time, when she previously was at City University in Hong Kong. Uh, good to see some old friends and uh, people who have been part of the work we've worked on for a little while. I've come today to talk to you about what makes, to think about what is it that makes a digital material a success. I've been producing digital and helping people produce digital materials now for some decades, and the question is, when does it get to be successful? And do we have a definition of success? We often don't. If you ask somebody, what would you say would constitute success for your project? And it's a little different than saying, if I'm writing a book, it's when I come to the last page and type the end. That's success. But as we all know, with digital material, there is no the end. And so we have to review and see what success is going to be for us. I put this up because I want to congratulate you here at the University of Western Sydney for a really um, wonderful program of digital materials that you are producing here. So I feel as if I'm coming to speak to a choir, perhaps. Uh, I don't know that I have anything so very new for you, but um, I can, I've been really interested to go through the projects that you have here and to see the caliber of them and to recognize how far advanced you are. I particularly like this one, the um, uh, FBTEE. -E. <laughs> um, these are the kinds of things that we've worked with in, in EKI. Uh, Ian Johnson is here who helped us develop, uh, help develop the time map aspect of EKI in the early days. Putting dots on the map, doing geo registration, all of that is essential, wonderful. And now the question is, when does it become successful? I first got introduced to the digital world a long time ago. In the 1970s, uh, Mr. Packard's son, David Packard, uh, was asked by his father, What would you like? This is your one-time gift from me for your life. So he had a sister, and the sister who was a marine biologist said, 
I wanted an aquarium. So he built the Monterey Aquarium for her, which is one of the largest research public aquariums in the world. And the son, who was a classic scholar, said, I want all the Greek literature from Homer up to 600. This was in the early 1970s. His poor father had to think how in the world to fulfill his pledge to his son to give him this great gift. They had to invent the machine, they had to invent the font, they had to invent the software, they had to do everything because we had never seen anything like it. We had nothing comparable. So they went off to Korea and got the Koreans to type it in for them. Because they figured that the Koreans did not read Greek, and so they wouldn't think. And there's nothing worse than having people who are doing your input who think. Because while they're thinking, they change things. When it was completed, about 10 years uh, after it was completed, I met one of the people at Berkeley who was in classics, and I said, you know, I really envy you, because you have all of your literature, the basic primitive literature, it's all in the computer. How has it changed the way you do your scholarship? There was this pause, and he said, not at all. A little faster? A little easier, but I'm still doing exactly what I've always done. That didn't set too well with me, but I kept it in my mind all the years. Is it a success if that's what happens with our input of text? That somebody says, oh, it's a little faster, it's a little easier. Is that success? <clears throat> The next project that I got involved with was the Pali Canon of Buddhism. This was the first of the Buddhist canons to be input. It was done at Mahikong University in Bangkok. I became involved with them. At the time, success was to put, download all that data onto a hard drive. So you had to send them a hard drive mail it to them. They would copy it on the hard drive and mail it back to you. Well, all, all of you know those early hard drives, this is before solid state, they were, they were very fragile. The chance that you got back your hard drive and something that really worked was just a crapshoot. So I went to them and they asked me to help them. And I said, first of all, forget the hard drive. You have to put it, at that time, on the CD-ROM. That would be success. So we worked to do that. And we did it. And the CD-ROM became very popular. It sold hundreds of copies. For the first time, the poly material, which was scattered here and there in libraries around the world, you could have it right in your own home. Not only that, but people in Thailand thought it was such a wonderful thing, they purchased the CD-ROM to put on their altars, and it became a votive object, which is very nice. <laughs> However, they, they allowed one thing which I felt was not a success. They allowed a senior monk to go through the database and correct the errors as he saw it with no footnote. So I said to them, you realize that what you've done is to create a new edition. This is not the Cyan edition that we had from the 19th century because we don't know what he changed. And how did he determine? Where did he get his readings? Then later, uh, the CD-ROM, of course, went out of style. Who wants a CD-ROM? We had to revisit it. That was not success after all. At the time, we felt, oh, this is success. We had to go back and put it on the internet. And putting it on the internet made uh, retraining 
helping people understand it, putting it up. So success is always just like the rainbow. It's always just out there. Oh, we think we've reached it, and we oh, oh, we have to go farther. The original thing was done for the 60th birthday of the king. The king decided that the first CD-ROM was not a success because it didn't have commentaries. So he's told by him, well, you've got to go back and put in the commentaries. All of us have done a digital project know that every time you do one, the minute you show it to somebody, they say, why don't you do it? <laughs> I tell you something that they really want you to add to it. They are never satisfied. So the king was not satisfied, and they did that, which was good. The next thing I worked with was the dynastic histories of China. That was also a big issue because when this was being done at Academia Seneca in Taiwan, um, there were no fonts, there were no codes for the Chinese characters that was standardized. There was a thing called the Big Five Code, and in the Chinese world, you probably don't hear anymore, the Big Five computer companies in Taiwan decided they would have a code. So, watching what they did with this, and going there and starting to use it seemed like the ultimate success. 40 million Chinese characters. I could search it for the first time. I could find a word in all of its places. It seemed like success. But of course, just being able to retrieve all the instances of a text, we've gone beyond that anymore. That's no longer success. My next project was to put in the Buddhist canon in Chinese. I followed the advice of the people who had done the dynastic histories at Akademi Silica. They told me exactly how to do it. They saved me a lot of effort. But as we did this, the question was, First of all, what do we put in? The characters on these blocks are 13th century versions of the characters who lives. They are not, they were not in any computer font for Chinese. Do we use the nearest example we can find for that character? And I said, no, if we do this, we have to put it in exactly as it is on the box. Otherwise, people don't know what they're looking at. You can't correct it. You can't change it. Because if you start changing it, then nobody knows what they're looking at. We had to make 13,000 user-defined characters. It was a project that took a long time. I joke when we tell people that when we're trying to raise money for it, they put me on a Korean television for one minute at 6 o'clock news. They said, you have one minute to try to convince people to fund this project. I know that I have to be punished for what I did. It's going to come sometime, probably in my next life. I said, we're trying to raise the money here in Korea. We haven't been able to do that, so next week I'm going to Japan. <laughs> I know, isn't that awful? <laughs> that night, a woman called her sister and said, we're good with this. That wretched professor from Berkeley, he's going over here to Japan to get money to put our Buddhist canon into the computer. Can't you talk to your husband? My belief, although I'm not sure, is the next morning at breakfast, she said, Honey, would you do this? And since Honey was Mr. Lee, the founder of Samsung, he said, Sure. 
So the next time we went to Kuguya, we had 35 full-time typists and 6 technicians. And within a year, they put in the whole thing. What's that success? <laughs> I asked myself after, I said, all right, 10 years after the Greek was put in, I asked the professor, how did it change the way you do it? And he said, not much. I promised myself that after five years of the completion of the Chinese, I would ask myself the same question. How much has this changed the way you do your work? And I was really saddened, I have to say, not much easier, faster. I was just like the colleague I had felt failed. So then I spent two weeks thinking, suppose I did do it completely, I did my work completely differently. How in the world would I do that? What would I do that would be so different that nobody had ever done it before? So I decided, I've always read, therefore to do it really differently, I can't read. And I thought to myself, if I don't read the text, how can I get anything out of it? And that's when I decided that in order to not read, I had to turn to image, to patterns of images, in order to work, work with the same material in a totally different way. So for example, there are 1,500 texts in the printing blocks. I made a blue dot for each of those texts. And I, when I searched for a word, the first thing that came up on the program was the two words, I could search for five words at once. It showed me in the whole stretch of the canon what the distribution of these words is. That was the first break in terms of not reading, just looking at the pattern. The next thing I did was to go down to the level of a word. So for example, in the printing block, have a character for the Buddha. So I asked my tech assistant, take all the characters in the Buddhist canon, 52 million, and turn them into blue dots. And put behind each blue dot 35 fields of Venetic so that the computer knows exactly where that character is, it knows its Unicode value, it knows when it was translated, it knows who translated it, it has all that information behind each dot. So dot is not just a pretty picture. It's got all that information behind it. So instead of looking at text, I began to look at panes of blue dots looking for patterns and the occurrence of words. And I used the catalog that I had produced, which took me seven years, a long time ago. I had it digitized by the University of Tokyo, and I used that as the metadata for each blue dot. I know where it is in that text, I know whether there's a Tibet, I have all that information. So, if I look up things using Google, it's going to give me 5,000, 10,000 examples, and I have to go to each one, page after page after page. And we never do that. Has anybody ever looked at the 20 millionth page of Google? <laughs> we usually go one page, two pages, that's it. We don't do it. Instead, when my character occurs, 
in those panes, in order for me to see the pattern of distribution, I turned the dot red. I got that from a young computer person in Berkeley. He said, I can teach you something really complex in a tenth of a second. Well, you know, these computer people like this. Sure. And so he filled the screen with a million blue dots. He turned one of them red for a tenth of a second, and 41 people in the room all saw it. He said, you realize what you did? You just ambiguated one out of a million in a tenth of a second because you used image and color. And image and color is what the brain is really wired for. So that's why I began to turn to image report. At the same time, analytic coming. Um, if you can count, as the old statement goes, count. I could count the number of occurrences and since I had the date for each of the texts in my material, I could make what I call a profile of word. How many times does this word occur in over time? And what is the profile? How does it look? <clears throat> to my amazement, when I then used that profile to search to say, any other words have this profile that came back and said, yes. It has a companion word that has exactly the same profile. This is really helpful with the Chinese because just because two characters in Chinese text come together doesn't mean they're a word. They're just combinations. They may be the last member of a preceding compound and the first member of the next compound. They don't necessarily belong to one another. So I said to myself, can I determine whether the two characters together are my word just using imagery? Whatever the two characters have a companion word, and wherever that companion word occurs, it's my word. That's one way to tell. So I began to work with occurrences in this way, and then I began to predict the past. Predicting the past is something we all have to do in scholarship. I predicted the past by going back and saying, this can't be correct. You cannot have this spike in the use of a term in the second century, the third century in this case, and for some centuries, it never occurs again until suddenly it, it begins to be used. This is an anomaly which is not right. The reason that text or those texts are misstated, they don't belong to that century. By my profile, they really belong probably to the fifth or sixth century. And that, I believe, is the case. Then I went to Sarah, and I said, Sarah, I have this visual thing. Can you help me uh, understand how can we use this? And she put it into 3D immersive environment. You can't see, but that's me walking through the text. You see the text as either dots or characters 12 feet high. Uh, you can turn 100 pages at once. You can see the patterns of occurrence in that kind of environment. You can bring up the reading if you want to read. And so within that 3D dimensional work, we began to figure out how can we begin now to go the next mile, to go into 3D and immersive and understand it. Uh, but Mike Fong is here, he, he's got his degree in Hong Kong. He worked on chiastic modeling, where you have a situation where you start off with a statement S, you have ABC, 
become the deeds, however, but, and then the statement reverses itself and goes CDA. And you find this kind of modeling in the Iliad, the Odyssey, Chinese detective stories, poems, you find it even in the loose canon. So this was a way in which I could ask the computer to visually begin looking for chiastic models. Why then? Because the repetitions in the chiastic model are used as a frame for the whatever is said and the however. That's the important place. The rest of it is just a frame. So you have all this repetition, but if you don't know it's framing, and you just read it straight, it doesn't make any sense, and it drives you crazy because you think, why are the same as over and over again? Yeah. We've also begun to try to figure out how to do automatic parsing. So we've gone through some of the loose text and actually parsed them in this grammatical analysis. This is done at City U in Hong Kong with their linguistic department. Now we're trying to teach the computer how to do this by giving it a, this is an example and saying, can you go through all the loose text and begin to mark them up by, by its analysis grammar? Really helps a lot because, for example, uh, what, the, what verb normally follows the word Buddha? It's either see or say. He looked and he said. It's amazing when you start searching grammatically. Then I set it up to the supercomputer at Illinois. And I said, I have 800 examples of this one word, which I want to know what is, can you figure out whether there's a pattern of a relationship which I am not been able to see? They sent this back and I said, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. However, um, a friend of mine down at UCLA, uh, Ted Tangerini, who works with uh, the Danish folklore, put in some 25, 250,000 folklore stories. And just threw it at the supercomputer and said, can you find a pattern? Didn't tell it anything. Computer came back finally after two days and said, all stories go into two conditions, this one and this one. And then Tim had to spend a long time figuring out what is the computer telling me? In other words, because you get a supercomputer analysis, you sometimes don't know what the computer has done and you don't know what it's telling you. After a very long time, Tim finally figured it out. The computer was saying, the stories are told either by a woman or a man. <laughs> and we can tell you which gender told the story. Almost 100% correct because the ethnographer who gathered it had the address of the place you met, the name of the person who gave him the story, and when you look up all the place names and the stories that are told, women only tell stories where the place names are in their immediate vicinity. Men tell stories about down the road, long distance place names. The computer found that. That to me was an, an incredible success story to say, if we really use the analytics of the computer, we may find out things that we never knew before. <clears throat> With my Ikai and the Atlas of Religions of China, we came up with this. We have 40,000 geo-reference points, and the question is, is that a success? And the answer we gave was no. Uh, what do you do with it? Nice picture. You can go in and click on each dot and give you information. And what do you do with it after that? How do you do with it? These are a timeline 
is uh, uh, working with the monasteries of, of Tibet. We know when they were founded. So we take our spreadsheets and we animate it. Not only does the animation help you because you can see the pattern of development, but when you come to the end of it, it's a surprise for most people. Most people thought that Tibetan Buddhism means this group down here and what we usually call Tibet. What are all those Tibetan monasteries doing up there in China? As many as there are in Tibet, there are that many in China. And very few people know that. So when you read about these monks in China who are burning themselves because of protest, they're all up there in that very powerful tradition of the that exists in China. So the animation sometimes is a, is a success. But I want to say that it's a failure in this regard. I can give you my executive summary of the data and an animated map. That's my kind of executive summary. But basically, I need to give you the raw data that you can use and do something with as well. I need to make available to the user my spreadsheets. And I need to build tools that will allow the user to take those spreadsheets and make new ideas from them. So uh, this is just another one of these. Uh, the Mosque of China, the Islamic Mosque of China. And again, it's a similar thing. But I'll show you a second one because every time we do an animation of many dots from geo-registry data, it surprises us. We didn't know, and we still don't know exactly what it means. In the case of the Islamic Mosque of China, you can see the big surprise, all of those dots above Korea. What in the world are the mosques doing up there? Why aren't they out west? Or why aren't they along the coastline? Where the traders are. What's going on in Islam in China? These are questions which are raised for us. So we can have just the dots, it's not it's good, but it's not a success. We can have the animation, it's good, but it still doesn't tell us sometimes what's going on. So then I go back to the supercomputer and I say, uh, I want to know from the supercomputer for the bus. Were they being destroyed starting in Beijing and spreading out across the country during the Cultural Revolution? And when they were rebuilt, did it start somewhere and move? And the answer from this is that the reconstructions and the destructions happened all over the country basically the same time. The old idea in Chinese history that everything goes out like a ripple from Beijing is no longer true when you look at this. There we see this white line down the middle of it. What, what that is is cultural revolution. We actually identified the cultural revolution when they started destroying the mosque and when they allowed them to rebuild. When they allow them to rebuild the mosque, cultural revolution is over. Regardless of what dates other people put on it, this is a way to actually see the reality on the ground. And then the last one is the current one that we're working on. This is Los Angeles. Uh, it's a little bit slow. California has Indian missions. This is something quite comparable, I think, to some of the work that you might find here in Australia with Aboriginals. Uh, we, with this group, help them geo-register several things. 
we help them geo-register all of the baptism records of the missions, which are almost complete from the very founding of the mission. They have a record of who was baptized, where they came from. If you take that kind of data and put it into this format, then uh, this is what was beginning to happen. Here's the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, this is what it looks like today. These are the places, but the missions that came were quite different. And all of these 29 planes were the Indian villages of the Los Angeles Basin. You will see it looks like ants. Each one of those is a baptismal record that has been geo-registered. They are not just willy-nilly. They are real things of people going to the mission, they get baptized, they stay, and they work for the mission. And as time goes by, what this does is destroys all of California in the admission of villages in the Los Angeles Basin. And they all went to the missions. And they worked in the missions as farm workers, basically. Is this a success? In many ways it is. It's wonderful, a wonderful work. Where it still leaves us with a question of how to handle it. Almost none of them lived. They all died of tuberculosis and measles. It was tragic. Their whole culture was destroyed in many ways. And while a few of these places are still known to the native peoples, we can see from this kind of research and the use of imagery, GIS, visualization, a whole pattern of what happens in the culture. So uh, now I'd like to ask Sarah to take over, and Sarah <coughs> will take her forward. I've been taking you in the past. These are things we worked out in the past. Every time we thought we had a success, we didn't. It was something else to be done. Some other something had to be done. And none of it yet has been a success. We're still struggling exactly with that problem. So what's the next step? And I believe that some of what I'm doing with Sarah represents here, basically here in Sydney, the next step. So Sarah. <coughs> Uh, at the Align Lab in Hong Kong, where we uh, have um, 
design large scale systems for universal socialization. And at the University of Victoria at Melbourne, who are also integrally invested in the development and design of new universal systems. So these are they, um, these nine systems. And they give us different strategies for embodiment um, with helpful data sets in the public domain. So if we look um, at a series of projects that will help inform um, the work that we are embarking on together with Bloom in the future. Uh, these are the Zhuguan Caves in the Gobi Desert, the northern most China, so it's 492 caves, 45,000 square meters of mural paintings, 42,000 uh, stubborn statues in size and breadth like nothing else in the Chinese Buddhist world. Uh, most of the caves are close to the public. There's a very serious digitization effort underway there. There are 600 full-time employees at Tunguan, between 60 and 90 full-time photographers. So it's a very significant undertaking, like no other World Heritage site, actually. Uh, it takes three months to digitize a single cave. They do it with laser scanning and camera array photography. And they stitch it in situ. Uh, so we took uh, the data set for cave 220 and put it into our AV system. AV is 10 meters across and 4 meters high. And this screen appears to be a bit stretched. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's round, it's not a long. Um, uh, yeah, and it's a 3D system. So we start with a bit of basic image browser of significant caves at Dongwan, which are located along the laser scan of the escarpment at Dongwan. Go into cave 220 and simulate what it's like to be uh, there now. If you visit Dongwan, it's quite a fragmentary experience. You're led around with 60 people with a guy with an LED torch. So in fact, you don't see very much. Um, because it's a virtual world, we can navigate it. We created a, a high-resolution magnifying glass so we could examine the murals in great detail. This is a sutra of the medicine rules on the north wall of this cave. Using the pigment studies, the, uh, uh, some of the iconography was recolored. Um, so this is based on Dulman Academy scholarship. There are 32 musicians in the painting, and all the instruments were modeled in 3D. Um, many other elements in the painting were also animated by modeling. Uh, we filmed Beijing Academy dancers in a blue screen studio, and then we inserted the video into the scene to represent the four dancers that appear in the painting. So it was a range of visualization strategies. It was a prototype project built for very little money, in fact, um, but it became a runaway success. And it's been seen by about 300,000 people. Uh, we run about 57 VIP tours to our lab in um, Hong Kong for this work. It went to the Free Sacra Gallery at the Smithsonian Institute to celebrate their 25th year um, celebrations. And at this time, uh, a critic noted something that I think is really important in the public engagement with digital materials. And he said, at last we have a virtual reality system that's worthy of inclusion devoted to the real stuff of art. And that's when digital stops becoming, it stops being a tool and is in its own right. And this is a really, really powerful thing to recognize and at the time that we are now in with high fidelity imaging. <laughs> We're connecting our AV systems together to teach distributed Silk Road studies using ultra high end bandwidth, Internet 2 backbone, or Arnet. Uh, so, this is an ongoing project. We took the laser scan from that uh, Cave 220 and printed it on the walls of an exhibition booth at exactly the same size as the real cave. So a lot of the work that we're doing is about one-to-one -one scale um, embodiment rather than miniaturization. <coughs> so with an iPad, you are walking around inside this model looking at very, very high-resolution images. Um, it's used a 16 infrared camera, so it's extremely smooth. You can do this with any kind of your location. Uh, you can look at the ceiling. What's important about this kind of work um, is that it's very, very social. Uh, and often in museums, yeah. so it's a, it's a bit of virtual tourism. 
Um, but often in museums, everybody is saying everyone needs their own device, and actually it's contrary to the notions of socialization in the museum, which is usually to bring people together around a common object. It's also multi-generational. She's cut off at the end there, but <laughs> grandmother and grandchild. This uh, has also toured to some countries. This is at the Shanghai Vietnam. Uh, we completed Place Humpy um, in 2006. This was for France India Year, based on the World Heritage Sites of the Jaganara in South India, um, a 13th to 15th century kingdom, um, and also a wonderful granite bowl field. Uh, this work launched in in France and then toured around the world. Uh, it's based around stereographic panoramas of that site. This is a, a very rare camera. There's only four of these in the world. Um, you can't do this digitally, actually. Um, you can't create true stereo parametric cameras. We also do ambisonic sound recording, and this is a very precise and uh, articulate way of um, creating through these um, uh, environments, spatialized sound. Um, use motion capture for animation. Um, the work is staged in a 360-degree screen that has a motorized platform in the middle, and you're rotating a field of view in uh, 360 degrees. Uh, it's passive stereo, maybe 25 people can be in the room at any one time, but one of the visitors will invariably jump on and take this Jet serendipitous journey of discovery through the location's space there. If you speak into a microphone, you release um, chapter 13 and 37 of the Ramayana to do with the gathering of the monkeys at Kishkinda, because Hanan is said to be Kishkinda. And once you go inside some of these panoramas, some of them are augmented with computer graphics done by Indian artists and animators. It was the first stereographic animation that was done in India. It was done in the island of the so this is your Ganesha. And he's embedded in the stereographic scene. We also have music by Dr. L. Subramanian, who's a chromatic violin superstar. This is now part of a new museum uh, next to the site, so it's a whole cultural precinct. I designed the museum that's part of this precinct. Uh, it's about 25 kilometers away, funded by Jindal Steel, who will hire a large um, family, actually, in India. Uh, so it has a number of rooms that really looks at the archaeological imaginary and different ways of imaging the landscape, drawing on all sorts of materials. A lot of photography by the Australian uh, photographer John Rollins, who spent 30 years documenting it. Um, the archive of George Michel portraits in a very low tech um, uh, interface here. They are the senior archaeologists there. George Michel is an Australian also. So there's a strong Australian connection with Hongi. Um, and we scanned uh, 150 of their. Archival images, everything to do with archaeological process and not to do with finish and conclusion. And it's very simple uh, with a barcode on when you scan it on the slide table and it projects on the wall with uh, labels in three languages, so Hindi, Canada, and English. We're just about to start the production of a new museum, the Place Karnataka Museum, which will be a combination of tangible and intangible heritage. So this will be in Bangalore, um, in Calvin Park. Um, there are 20 historic locations there. We'll do stereographic panoramas through the house. A whole lot of 360-degree video. So we'll all play back in more or less one-to-one scale. This is actually in the temple of the large scale, so it's not going to come out of And we'll do a whole series of performances and also um, festivals throughout that state. Uh, we do archaeological sites and historic sites, but we also deal with objects. <coughs> this is a section of the 18 meter long pacifying of the South China Sea Pirate Scroll painting from the Hong Kong Maritime 
Museum. It is their icon item. And we scanned it at 1,200 dpi, which basically allows me to zoom in and see more than you can see with your naked eye. So it's um, We took it and animated 55 events, several vignettes per scene, and 20 scenes in this painting. And the seamless interactive, we opened in several animated events up, played out. So it's all quite, it's about the bloody encounters between pirates, so it's usually quite grisly depiction. <laughs> Chopping people's heads off and blowing them up and burning the villages and um, Yeah, Another way to look at objects in museums is, is the problem that only a fraction of the collection is on display. So at the British Museum, it's 0.4%. At Museum of Victoria and Melbourne, it's 0.8%. So we're just finishing a data browser for Museum of Victoria. They own a 360 3D system that's permanently installed. And this is a data browser for 100,000 objects from the museum's collection. So this will be on public display, and visitors are able to browse, take a journey through the collection. Visually, we don't have, uh, didn't install a search engine. We created a Wordle from the content management um, uh, description, but you can also access that data, and all of the elements are linked uh, throughout the data set. So you're traversing indigenous material, natural sciences, and social history in that group. So it's looking at a kind of, well, heading towards a post-Cartesian framework for understanding collections. Uh, we also deal with objects um, or harvest data from the internet. This is a work done together with Europeana for World War I uh, in 2012. It takes their crowdsourced data set, so they're driving around in Europe. People are coming out of their houses and their familiar is ingested or scanned and then ingested into the system and the people go back to their houses with their material. It's great stuff, it's filled with propaganda, wonderful art, going in the trenches, prosthetic devices, <laughs> lost loves, miracles. This guy was sleeping with the Bible on his heart and the Bible went, uh, the bullet went into the Bible and he was saved. Um, it's staged against a series of satirical maps using the 15 fields of metadata. It's a very low-budget project again, um, and simply harvests the data off the API and represents it on the screen. You don't do anything to it. Um, so the curators chose particular objects they wanted to start this experience. And as soon as you launch an image, you launch the data and you attach to it, and you can start to traverse those data sets and that motivation. There's 70,000 objects in there, so you can refresh the circle that you've chosen. There's also in multiple languages, which in this version is just in English. Now you can use a Microsoft to translate the objects. It's really about unleashing the potential of the internet. So we're um, busy with full bones and together with PWS we're at Chamber Grant in for a 4K full bone for digital humanities um, together with Paul Arthur. This is a work done or an animatic done for the uh, National Museum of Qatar. It's working out there for about a year and it's an exhibition to do with migration and navigation. It's a 20 meter dome but it has a mirror on the floor so it's suspended between the two image spaces. Um, it starts with that Arab night sky and then it goes out across the desert um, and off to sea. Qatar is, as you probably are aware, only 35 kilometers long and it's desperately ugly, so it takes a lot to evoke uh, an interesting aesthetic experience. <laughs> This is just stuff on their content management system, which is embryonic at this stage, but it's a, it will be a glorious building. Um, so, 
uh, where we will install in December a new work for the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai. So I've just come back from Mumbai and shot 160 gigapixel images. So this is a 10,000 pixel um, fisheye derived from one of those feral panoramas of all different places throughout Mumbai. These will be projected up into the dome, the 100-foot dome of the Prince of Wales Museum. Um, very simple transitions and three floors below we can't resist but to put a little mirror in there. So it's looking up and looking down and we'll also include satellite maps and historic images from the British Library, historic maps. So these are somewhat nasty video transitions, but we have an algorithm that does really good capture matching. So I will go more between these images quite um, seamlessly. It's an Indian Sarasanic building. It's quite fantastic. Uh, we're busy with the tangible heritage. So Hong Kong Kung Fu, all the South Chinese lineages, all the senior masters. One of the images is the same as Bruce Lee. Um, and this project is, is quite enormous and it's turned out to be very expensive. So we've been mocapping these guys in our mocap studio, but it's actually in the cleanup of the data that um, it's become very expensive. But it's very high resolution, you're shooting at about 140 frames a second, they're very fast. Um, and it will create a reservoir of 3D data. I won't go into this, and I'll send you a link to the, um, our fringe backup. That's the same as Kickstarter website, which we're just watching. I'll maybe send that to the board. But it's, it's for teaching and learning in the future. It's going to die. We're taking our nine platforms, uh, putting them as one big world touring exhibition of sacred materials, um, expressions of the sacred. So this will be a major world touring exhibition by Museum Victoria, a world first. Um, quite a challenge and a uh, very spectacular. And together with Lou, um, the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. So this is a, a big project we're embarking on at the moment, uh, derives from um, research done by Ikai and done by um, Professor Lancaster for some years. Uh, and it looks at, essentially at this point, we're looking at the um, transfer of Buddhism from <coughs> India through Southeast Asia up into China and down into Korea and Japan. So it's looking at numerous sites throughout those locations, both seaports and rivers that connect to the seaports and then roads are obviously fundamental in the transfer of both trade and sacred knowledges. Uh, and it's the counter story to the very well-known overland routes for Buddhism in China, uh, which everybody is familiar with, but nobody really talks about the maritime aspects of this. So it's a much bigger map, but we're starting with a discrete chunk, which we think is politically relevant, which is the Southeast Asian um, and Chinese area supported by an enormous amount of archaeological material. Uh, and we're working really on two uh, aspects, which is spatial narrative, so using a Google Earth type of mapping, um, or an interactive Earth mapping to locate all of these sites, and any member of the public can then enter inside uh, a stereographic panorama of that location. So once they've done that, this, they can uh, see that stuff. So um, it can be uh, distributed in the world in such a way. And then we will augment each one of those stereographic panoramas with the archaeological material that supports that story um, that we have in the data space. Um, so it will be a range of modalities um, for the visualization. The more complex underlying data set will also be visualized in a uh, interactive touch wall scenario. So this is where you can type and you can see multiple operations and uh, different scenarios there. So that's really, I think I can do it. <laughs> I've got more to do um, evaluation and also we are into high resolution scanning. 
So if you'd like to go to a workshop on such a thing, I'll just do my little plug in the workshop. It's here. So um, the Maritime Museum scroll that I mentioned that we scanned, we now have the equipment in Australia. It's, it's the first for Australia. This is the living scan. It does as close to true color scanning as is possible. Um, we're doing projects all over the world. We just scanned um, some paintings of the DNA and some work for the State Library and the Art Gallery. Uh, and this is actually one of um, Barkin's etchings of Constantinople that he showed with the original panorama at Leicester Square that's in the State Library here. Um, from one on the spot. And we have an image viewer, and this is the workshop, like Snap workshop. So if anybody's interested, I can also send the details to Paul.